Good morning, everybody. Amber, is it snowing in Southeast Kansas? Well, I live in Missouri, so there was mm. just a little dusting kind of in like on the eaves of the houses and in the gutters, but it wasn't doing anything actively when I got here. Mm -hmm. It's cold. Yeah, it is cold. Good morning, everybody. We're comparing where it's snowing. Sorry, I missed that. What are we comparing? Whether it's snowing where we are. Is it snowing in Olathe? Oh, yeah. It's not like deep but it's definitely blowing big time mm -hmm. you know, blowing um but it's mostly slick more than anything yeah that's not what i want to hear emily i have to go to kansas city this afternoon <laughs> oh yeah uh be safe um my understanding is that by tomorrow it's supposed to not be what it is today um yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't need to leave till like after one. So I'm hoping that it's better. <laughs> well, I, what I can do is check in with my husband and find out how the roads were when he went to work and I can text you or message yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I think we should be okay. But yeah, if he checks in with you, you might ask. <laughs> I will. I definitely will. Because I would like to see you be safe. <laughs> I will be safe. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. There we go. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our first meeting of 2021. I hope all of you are warm and cozy and looking forward to a great new year. Um, I know that I am certainly really glad to be with all of you this morning, and I'm looking forward to what the new year has in store. Um, today, we're going to be doing a little bit of reflecting back on work that's been done, a little bit of uh, reflecting forward in terms of how we as a panel can continue to work effectively and what we might prioritize in the future. We are going to hear about work that's underway and have some great follow up from our previous meetings where we dig a little bit deeper into uh, Kansas tax policy as it relates to supporting child care. So I hope that you're all eager and excited for a fantastic meeting and I'll go ahead and kick us off. Um, thank you all of you for committing. I know that it's uh, a busy time and that uh, we certainly really appreciate that you have made time to make this be a priority in 2021. Uh, obviously we're meeting remotely today. Um, that means a couple of things for the folks who may be listening out on YouTube. Um, the video live stream of this meeting can be found on the Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund website. Participants will make sure that their microphones and phones and et cetera are muted when they're not speaking. And the chat function is going to communicate with Chris, our technical assistant, um, but is not going to be a feature for having panel communication since folks can't see it on YouTube. 
Um, each mo motion, if any, will be clearly stated before the committee votes, and I'll ask for a show of hands and then clearly announce uh, the results of the final vote. Um, panel members, you do have the handy dandy raise hand feature, and when we have big conversations, that does make my life a whole lot easier uh, when I'm trying to, to manage the Zoom. So uh, check that out if you haven't seen it already. And please do remember to clearly identify yourself um, when you begin speaking. So today's agenda uh, is posted on the Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund website. Uh, people can navigate to the About section and take a look at the Panel tab and see the Meetings section. And there they can see both the slideshow and the agenda. Um, so today we have, as I, as I shared, we'll, we'll have a discussion of um, our, our regular business at the top, as we usually do. Uh, we will visit about Kansas child care tax credit policy, where we hear a presentation with some additional information on some of the topics that we discussed last month and have time for questions and discussion. Um, and then we'll really focus in on our uh, role, norms, and procedures document. We'll make some updates to make that document more readable. Um, and then we will reflect on our work over the past six months and discuss whether there's anything that we should change about our processes or the way that we do our work um, and what we should prioritize moving forward. We will take a break around 10.15. Um, I forgot to set an alarm on my phone for 10.15, so I'll be looking at my clock, but if it's around 10.15 and I haven't uh, uh, got us out to a break yet, feel welcome to help hold me accountable and hold up your hand and say, hey, I think it's about 10.15, um, and so we can make sure that we stretch and get some time to step away from our computer screen for a minute. So with that, um, I'm looking for two motions. Uh, the first is an approval of the agenda. Would anybody like to make a motion to approve the agenda? Um, this is Amy Meek. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you, Amy. Would anybody like to second that? This is Gail this... Cozad. I'll second. Thank you, Gail. I appreciate it. All in favor, could you uh, hold up your hands or give us a thumbs up emoji? Okay, go team. Um, do we have anybody who is opposed to that? Fantastic. Our agenda is approved. Did we, we didn't receive any feedback back on those December meeting minutes. Did we have any, uh, any adjustments or edits to those minutes? Then I'd keep an eye out for a motion to approve those minutes. Bless you, Chelsea. This is Dave Lindemann, so move. Thank you, Dave, I appreciate it. Would somebody like to second? This Cornelia is Cornelia Stevens, I second. Thank you, Cornelia. Uh, all in favor, same, same sign. If you could hold up your hand or uh, give us a thumbs up. Fantastic. Uh, any concerns? Go team. We've approved our meeting minutes. Uh, next on our agenda is the Kansans Open Forum. This is a chance for folks to come to the panel and share any comments on uh, topics that they believe that we should be aware of. Debbie, I don't believe that we had anybody sign up to provide uh, open forum comments today. Um, no. So we will move on to the next portion of our meeting. As a reminder, if people ever do have um, pieces where they'd like to share comments with the panel, um, you can feel welcome to let them know if they're saying like, gosh, I've got this issue and I'm not quite sure where to take it. Um, this is a good time to be able to get that on our radar. I will turn it over to Debbie to talk us through our follow-up from previous meetings. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. So we're going to start off by talking about some of our work groups and what they have going on. Our kindergarten transitions uh, work group continues to be productive. We most recently met, I believe last week, I can't keep track of my days, but uh, we wanted to get started on the dissemination plan for the MOU toolkit that we worked so hard on last fall. And um, so they spent that hour working on language to uh, put together an introduction or an explanation uh, page on as a preface to the MOU toolkit about just the importance of kindergarten transitions and what success looks like and why that's, why that's so important. Uh, we also have another meeting scheduled uh, next week on the 22nd to continue that conversation. And um, hopefully within the next meeting or two, we'll wrap up that dissemination plan. 
Uh, moving on to our Kansas Beats the Virus group, um, just a reminder, this is an initiative that was started by the Kansas Leadership Center in partnership with the state of Kansas, and it is put together to inspire uh, groups that are alumni of the Kansas Leadership Center to uh, continue the positive messaging of uh, safe safety practices in Kansas for the pandemic. And so we uh, gathered a group of 10 KLC alumni from the panel um, and invited anyone else that was interested to join us as well um, to put together what our plan was. And the decision was made to do a social media campaign uh, throughout the Early Childhood Network to also and also utilize the cabinet's website and Twitter accounts to help with that, as well as the panel member agency organizations that can use their uh, social media platforms to share that information. So we have our meeting scheduled next week as well on the 22nd, and we're going to continue uh, talking about this, identifying uh, talking points that we wanna get out there with this messaging, and also uh, want to try to be creative in using uh, pictures and dialogue from children to convey this message. So I'm looking forward to continuing that work. And last, um, our Engaging Providers Work Group, which is a brand new group. We have not gotten the chance to meet yet, but out of conversations that happened in the December meeting, especially during the uh, Child Care Development Fund uh, conversations, which we're gonna hear more about that here in a second. But Melissa had suggested that the panel, um, you know, really needs to recommend strategies to better engage child care providers and families. And so we formed a work group and I had a lot of interest from panel members to be a part of that. And our initial meeting is scheduled for January 27th. And I, I'm looking forward to beginning those important conversations that will identify the strategies to empower providers. And I think we're gonna also end up tying family members into this as well, into being engaged in the high level decision policy making um, that happens in Kansas for early childhood. So that is on the horizon. Moving on to um, some policy recommendation conversations that happened last month. This conversation was started by Mitch Rucker's open forum comments regarding the Kansas Action for Children's Advocacy work for policies that affect early childhood in Kansas that uh, during the upcoming legislative session. And Mitch is going to be joining us as a presenter today uh, to make a further presentation on questions that the panel had surrounding the early childhood tax credit in Kansas. But um, as part of that conversation uh, regarding our role in policymaking advocacy, some of the takeaways that we have from that is that first, um, as we know, the panel serves as an, as an advisory group to the Children's Cabinet. And it would be appropriate for us to dig into technical details of policy proposals that might come up to workshop and brainstorm uh, regarding the details of specific policy proposals and to eventually, if needed, work through a process to make formal recommendations to the Children's Cabinet while influencing the Kansas early childhood system both now and into the future. And individual panel members do have the ability to independently advocate and offer testimony from their own organizations and their points of view, but we don't anticipate that the panel staff will be making recommendations or presenting testimony at this time to the legislature. But that we can uh, kind of mimic what we were able to do with the kindergarten MOU toolkit and we can create toolkits and messaging to create shared understanding of the value of policy proposals um, in our role as a panel. At this time, I'm going to ask Nichelle Adams to um, share with us what's happening with the Child Care Development Fund work that we also heard about last month. Thank you, Debbie. Um, so we are still planning uh, the CCDF feedback sessions because we want to make sure that it's very meaningful for everybody involved. Um, we also want to make sure that we're able to learn how we might be able to obtain ongoing input on 
what we're using our CCDF funds for and all the related work in the future. So we're still hoping to schedule those discussions in the next couple weeks so that they can take place before the end of February. We'll make sure and keep everybody up to date. Thank you. Thank you, Nichelle. And uh, Amanda, that's all I have at this time. Awesome, thanks to both of you. Do we have any questions for uh, on any of those pieces? All right. Uh, Amanda, oh, yeah, uh, this ahead. is Paula. Just a really quick question. I know that in the uh, federal level, they've passed additional um, COVID relief funding. And so it would be nice to hear a little bit more at some point about what the state is planning to do with those dollars. Specific Absolutely. to child care. Absolutely. And Melissa, I think that you have a little bit, I, I see you raising your hand. Yes. Thanks, Amanda. A great question, Paula. Um, the, the, Road ahead is, is still being determined. Um, there have been some high level meetings, the Office of Recovery is making some adjustments. In the new relief package, it's important to note that the funding is directed to specific programs at state agencies. So where the CARES Act had a, a fund that was about a billion dollars that was discretionary spending for the state, which is why we went through the whole SPARC task force, Office of Recovery, State Finance Council approval process to determine special programs to fund with it. This new funding is all tied to specific programs. So there's a great big bump for CCDF. There is funding for Department of Education. I, I'm sure I'm, you know there are programs at every agency that will benefit. There's a lot of emphasis on the vaccine distribution um, efforts so, so that we can bring on manpower and, and acquire all of the things that need, need to be done. So it, it will look different than the CARES Act did. And I, there's um, still discussion about what, the, there is an extension of the date for the CARES Act funding but as of yet, I don't have um, I, I don't have direction on whether those programs will be continued or whether that that existed prior to the December 30th date or whether there will be different decisions made with remaining CARES Act funding. So that I'm, I'm looking for direction before we know anything more about it. But um, there is significant funding heading to Kansas for very important programs, so stay tuned. And Paula, I'm hopeful that by our next meeting, we'll have, um, I, I'm not sure about, about other state agencies, I know at, um, at, at the Kansas State Department of Education, we're expecting that funds will be available for schools to draw down in early March. Um, and there are some key pieces where we're still waiting on guidance from federal agencies, and so, um, I'm, and I see Michelle uh, nodding along as well. Michelle, I'm not sure if you have anything specific to add around the Child Care Development Fund dollars. Yeah, so we also are still waiting for federal guidance. We've received nothing. We don't even really know the amounts except for what CLASP has um, kind of determined might be what we'll receive. Um, so yeah, there's the act itself does have some specific ask for the CCDF related um, new COVID funds. Any other questions on the follow-up from previous meetings? All right, not seeing any, I would like to turn it over to uh, Mitch Rucker from Kansas Action for Children to visit us with us about Kansas Child Care Tax Credit Policy. Take it away, Mitch. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and other members for having me back uh, for a bit of a more in-depth conversation around the tax credit uh, policy. So uh, I wanted to start off by just giving a little bit more background than was in my written and, and verbal testimony last uh, time that I was here. So the uh, first slide here is the existing state of play for the tax credit. So as you can see, it's very narrow and who can apply and apply for and receive it. 
Um, it's limited at, at 3 million and uh, covers about half of the expenses for on-site care and 30% for uh, those uh, employers who choose to pay for childcare offsite or help their employees um, uh, find a childcare provider. Um, the last note there is that it's fully refundable, meaning that if uh, a business has less, uh, a lower tax liability than uh, the amount of the credit that they would receive. So say uh, a business owes $15,000 and uh, they're eligible for $45,000 from this credit, they would get a check back from the state for the, for the difference between those two. So they'd get a check back for $30,000, if that makes sense. Um, the, in looking back at some of the historical context, um, it looks like the changes that we want to make were already uh, part of the tax credit when it came into existence in 1991. And the change to limit it to the C corporations and to privileged taxpayers is the way that it's written, which essentially means banks, um, was made in 2013, uh, presumably because uh, the taxes for those types of businesses for LLCs and pass-through entities were eliminated in a different tax bill um, that was passed in 2012 and, and took place in 2013. So presumably they made that change to um, fit within that context. And then uh, when, when uh, those tax eliminations were repealed in 2017, nothing was done with this credit to bring it back to how it was originally uh, when it was instated. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I did receive a bill draft from the revisor's office on Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, this week has seemed like four um, with the session going on. And uh, they, uh, so what's in that bill as it currently stands, and of course it will still have to go through the legislative process through, you know, both House and Senate committees and the House and Senate floor and all that. Um, so, you know, it's subject to change uh, at their discretion, but how it stands right now and what we're proposing is that we would expand the eligibility beyond C corporations and banks uh, to all types of businesses. Um, so LLCs, sole proprietorships, pass-through entities, et cetera. Uh, so any employer could apply for this credit and we would eliminate the, the drop down um, of the amount that they're eligible for, for on-site care. So we would keep it at 50% and uh, in all years, not have it 50% in the first year and then 30% for years two through whenever they stop. So we would stop that. Um, why we're trying to do this is, you know, the, the credit is currently underutilized. I think I did mention um, last month that while, while it's capped at $3 million, only about $100,000 in that credit is being used. Um, and so we wanna, you know, make sure that more employers are taking advantage of this and helping their employees find childcare um, and pay for it. Um, we know that that's, that's a big burden for a lot of Kansas families. And so we wanna get more money into the system. Um, we think that this is also um, a somewhat, you know, I'm not saying it'll be easy, um, but we think that this is a, a really good concrete piece of policy that can start the conversation around investing funds in childcare. Um, and so, you know, with something that's already existing, something that um, as you see in the third, the last bullet point there, it will have no impact on the state budget. They already account for it um, costing $3 million. And so that price tag would not go up. And so uh, we think that that's especially important here in uh, these kind of uncertain budgetary times for the state due to the pandemic. And, uh, you know, so we think that this, this should be a way to, to start that conversation in a way that won't, um, you know, totally have, have folks, uh, you know, Get their get their haunches up. So, with that, um, I think I'd, I'd reserve the balance of our time here today for questions um, and to let y'all know what you want to know. Thank you, Mitch. Panel members, uh, what questions or what thoughts do we have? Uh, this is Amy Gottschammer. I have a, a thought slash question. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, so I. As you're speaking, Mitch, I'm I'm thinking in terms of the the workforce 
as we know, is undercompensated and rarely gets any benefits. But one of the benefits that child care providers can offer is child care for, for their, their workforce. Um, but it often results in a loss to the business itself. You know, they either provide free or reduced child care for their employees. Um, so would you envision that this would be something, I, I think the answer is yes, because you're saying all businesses, that would then be an upside to businesses, to, to child care providers that are already maybe offering it for a free or reduced price and taking the hit and um, and also maybe a potential benefit for uh, child care providers that didn't feel that they could afford to do that before. Yes. Um, so as long as it's a, a, as long as the child care provider is registered as a business, as long as it's a for-profit um, entity and not a non-profit provider, then yes, it, it should uh, qualify for this credit. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, Mitch, are you saying that uh, the only eligible child care providers are those that are for-profit providers, not non-profit? Is that, is that what I understood? For for the purpose of this particular tax credit, that is the case um, because of uh, you know the, the nonprofits don't have a tax liability, and so we can't okay. uh, really do much for them through a tax lens. There are other ways that we could help those out, but but not this way. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. And can I ask a follow up question on there? So, a for profit you have to be a for profit entity to claim the tax credit. But mm -hmm. if I'm a business and I have a contract with a nonprofit entity to have slots placed in in their facility for my employees, I would still be able to claim the credit because I'm a for profit entity. Yes, as long as you're paying for providers, even if it's at a nonprofit center, um, then you would still as the business be able to claim the credit. Okay, thanks for the follow up because um, that, that was my question. Uh, so the, the child care facility can be nonprofit. The business itself has to be for profit. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. You know, I've got a question for the panel members. I'll, I'll fully acknowledge I was not terribly familiar with uh, this component of Kansas child care tax credit policy. Um, do we have folks on here who uh, are familiar with this, who have used it before, who knew that it existed, who have had conversations about it? Well, Mitch, I'm really glad that Kansas Action for Children, I'm seeing um, kind of the same general uh, uh, reaction that I had when you came to present to us uh, last week, which was kind of a general, huh, that is a, an interesting piece for us to know. So I'm really excited that we, uh, that we are getting that information, that we're getting that information out there. Yeah, um, I, add, uh, I mean, that's the same reaction that I've gotten with pretty much everybody that I've talked to around the state about this, is that nobody knew that this was a thing. Um, and so helping spread the word that like, hey, uh, this you're, you're eligible for this. If you're helping your employees with childcare or if you're thinking about it, you know, you can help, uh, you know, reduce your tax liability um, when you do so. So helping spread the word will be an essential component um, of making this successful. This is Amy Gottschammer again. Um, is there a way that, who do we tell people to go to to get help in, in making this happen? Do they turn to their CPAs or or who? In terms of uh, once it's already in, in effect? Yes. Yeah, um, your accountant or if they do their own taxes. It's a one page form. I guess I could have dropped a link to that um, in the page, but in terms of actually claiming the credit for as a business, it's a, it's a one page addendum to your tax filing. Um, so it's not a complicated tax credit to claim. Um, so yeah, I would just suggest, you know, if they use a tax professional to, to ask them about, you know, put it on their radar and, and make sure that you're getting that. Got it, thank you. And you know what, I, I think this might be a, a good point or a good time to remind um, panel members, when we were doing the um, the community sessions for the in, in 2019 for the All In for Kansas Kids Needs Assessment and Strategic Plan, we had really great uh, representation and response from local economic development uh, entities and from the Kansas Department of Commerce's regional offices. And, and one piece that we highlighted is that the Kansas Department of Commerce does have those regional offices in. Um, in regions in the state where there are people who are available to help support uh, businesses and help support uh, 
the, the business community in Kansas to be able to uh, advance good public policy and be sustainable. So those might actually be a, a resource to be able to turn to when we're thinking about um, you know, spreading the word about tax credits or other economic development incentives that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, I also find myself wondering, um, and I'm looking for Gail, um, I, I find myself wondering whether the Kansas Power of the Positive Coalition, Mitch, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, um, with their work, but we heard a presentation from them a couple, yeah, I see you're nodding. We had a presentation from them um, several uh, several months ago, and they've developed really great relationships with um, a lot of businesses and, and chambers of commerce and others who are um, who, who are looking at childcare as a, a, an important component. It might be that they would be a, a good um, connection to make as we're trying to spread the word about the existing credit or about changes that might be made. Go ahead, Gail. This is Gail Kozad. Uh, so yes, we have already been in contact with Mitch um, and have. Um, been working with him <clears throat> on the work that they're doing to um, uh, encourage this. So yeah, we will continue to work together. Absolutely. Yeah. Thirteen. What an appropriate background for this morning. I was surprised by the snow on the ground. <laughs> Mitch, can you remind us of the the time frame for what we might expect to have happen? I know that you said that you've got a bill draft back. Yeah. So I got that back uh, earlier this week. We are having um, the Kansas Society of CPAs review it just in case they catch something that that we miss. I'm just trying to do our due diligence there before we introduce it and, you know, don't want to get off on the wrong foot uh, having the CPAs against us in, in committee. Um, and so once uh, we get it back from them with their um, approval or, or their edits, we'll go back to the revisers, make sure everything's good to go, and uh, then get it introduced in both the House and Senate. Um, so I would, I, I hope, um, to get it back um, with the CPA's edits, uh, you know, in the next week or so, hopefully. Um, and, uh, you know, then, you know, if, if there's minimal changes or, or no changes at all, then the following week, you'll probably get it introduced um, in, in committees. And then it's, it's uh, work in the inside uh, game, trying to get a hearing and, and get it uh, scheduled for a vote. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll see some real movement. And what are some good ways for either members of the panel or anybody who might be listening on YouTube to stay up to date with, um, I, I know that the news can be uh, a little overwhelming when we're thinking about all the things happening in Topeka on any given day or, or anywhere else in the world. So um, how can people stay up to date on the, some of this stuff? Yeah, um, I, I would you know, encourage you to feel free if you're interested in, in uh, helping advocate for this on an individual level uh, with your organization or your, your child care business. Um, then, you know, feel free to just send me an email at mitch at kac.org and I'll be sure to uh, keep you up to date and let you know, um, you know, as we kind of hit those milestones. And, uh, you know, if you'd be interested in providing testimony, um, please let me know that too. And I will uh, let you know when, when that will be needed. Um, so, and that would be very much appreciated. Need the whole uh, chorus of voices here when it comes to, to making good policy, so reach out and I'll, I'll keep you in the loop. Fantastic. Panel members, I know that I had a couple of questions there. Do we have any other questions or, or feedback or comments as we're thinking about this piece moving forward? All right, well, thanks so much for being with us this morning, Mitch. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, oh, and I'll remember, so, um, we, I do not move to our next slide, but if you're interested, I'm betting, Mitch, that that one-page form is on the, um, the Kansas Department of Revenue website where there is the, um, the, the homepage for this tax credit. Yes. Yes, I believe. I'm not on it right now, but I think that's where I found it. Yes. Go team. So, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to you all today. You're welcome. Take care. All right. Um, so next up, I will turn it over to uh, Chelsea Schulte to visit with us about uh, our role, norms, and procedures of the panel document and propose changes to make it more understandable. Take it away, Chelsea. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, this is Chelsea. I, after we put together our um, initial set of norms, procedures, roles, all of that, um, 
one thing that stood out to me was the use of the word shall um, in it. And that's just kind of a, a trigger, I guess, for me that it um, alerted me that we should maybe be looking at it um, through the lens of, lens of the plain language guidelines. Um, specifically, the use of shall is one that they um, point out that we should be using the word must if something is required um, or should if it's a recommendation. Um, so I have gone through, I guess maybe this is on the next slide, sorry. Um, yeah, so those plain language guidelines are really just there to help us make sure the first time you read something that you know what it means, that you don't have to look at it a hundred times to figure out what it's saying. Um, so the main things on the next slide um, that were changed or are proposed to be changed right now is replacing shall with either must, should, or will. Um, simplifying language so that it is an active voice um, saying what we're going to do. Um, and then referring to the children's cabinet consistently throughout it. You'll notice that those three things don't change in a few places in the, in the document simply because it's uh, like a quote from another document. So there are still some instances of those things, but where we could, I've um, tracked changes on that document where I would propose we change those. Awesome, thank you, Chelsea. And I will highlight for everybody, if you haven't already seen um, the Kansas Child Magazine from Child Care Aware Kansas is now online, which is really exciting. And Chelsea, it really did spark a lot of joy when I was flipping through to see your article on uh, plain language and how it's something that everybody can use wherever they're, they are, or whoever they're writing for to make things uh, a lot more readable. So thank you for uh, really highlighting this. Um, panel members, do we have any questions or comments about um, about any of the uh, proposed changes that we've shared out via email. Not seeing any, we've got a draft motion if somebody would like to make it um, to accept those or adopt those changes. This is Emily Barnes. Um, I moved at Kansas Early Childhood Recommendations Panel adopt the proposed plain language changes to role norms and procedures of the panel document shared with the panel members on December 23rd. Awesome, thank you, Emily. Would anybody like to second that? This is Natalie McLean, I will second that. Thank you, Natalie. Is there any discussion? All right, folks, we know the drill. Uh, feel welcome to raise your hand or give us a thumbs up emoji if you'd like to do that. Thanks everybody. Uh, any opposed? And Emily uh, noted to me that she is in favor um, and is having some camera issues. Thank you, Emily Kalo. Um, so we have a unanimous uh, adoption of this motion. Thank you to Chelsea. I do think that um, you know, this is a great reminder. I know that this is something where we can always work to, to do better in this area and that um, I get reminded of that. I, I think it's a Mark Twain quote where it's like, you know, I, I would have written a short letter, but I didn't have the time. And so I wrote a long letter. It takes a little bit more time sometimes to really go back through and say, all right, how do we translate all of our, um, our jargon and our technical language? How do we really say what the heck are we trying to say here and how do we make it really clear? Um, and I really want to thank Chelsea for uh, stepping up to hold us to our norm that says, gosh, if we are going to be uh, doing the work on behalf of the Kansas Early Childhood System, then it should be in a way that Kansans could actually read and understand what we're talking about. Um, so thanks for uh, moving our role norms and procedures document in that direction. I'd recommend for everybody visiting the plainlanguage.gov website um, to take a look at some of those recommendations. Um, as you might imagine, it is really easy to read and understand. So that is uh, a helpful way to just think about some of those tips and tricks. Um, Chelsea's article in Kansas Child is also really great. I think there's eight or 10 tips that you can incorporate into your writing right away. Um, and then one, uh, one tool that you might be interested in checking out is the Hemingway application. You can copy and paste uh, language into that and it can show you, gosh, here's a, it'll, it, it's color coded, it's pretty easy to follow where it says, you know, here's a place where you could use a simpler word, here's a place where you're using passive, uh, passive voice. Um, and so it's a good helpful tool to have. 
Panel members, we are running, um, that wraps up this section, and we are running quite a bit ahead of schedule. If it's all right with all of you, I'm thinking that it would make sense for us to start talking about our reflections and then uh, take a break as we scheduled at 1015. Um, I don't know about any of you, but I, if we do uh, wrap up this meeting a little bit early today, I think that we might all welcome some time back in our, in our day. Um, so we will take a break at 1015. But I wanted to, uh, so, when we're thinking about this section, I think um, way back in July, when we uh, adopted our rule norms and procedures, we highlighted that it would be helpful for us to revisit this document. We were uh, a new group coming together for the first time, and we had an idea for what our work might look like or for what our meetings might look like. Um, but we were in a very new stage. And so we thought, gosh, it would really be helpful for us to revisit this um, at about the six month mark to be able to um, see what we've learned, see what's working and see where we can still improve. Um, and I know that I have really appreciated that we have had a real openness and flexibility to figuring out how we can best accomplish meaningful work um, over the course of the last six months while recognizing that, um, that we are, are learning and growing and understanding how we want our Kansas early childhood system to work best. Um, so I, my ask for each of you is to, um, you know, to pause for just a minute. I think that we announced that we would be uh, creating this panel in, I think it was February, 2020. If I'm remembering right, it was at a Kansas Association of School Boards. Um, it, it was in their building. It was at a Kansas Children's Cabinet meeting. Um, and we shared that this was going to be uh, something that we were going to be incorporating into our Kansas early childhood system. And sometime between then and I think about April of 2020, um, each of you decided to fill out an application and say, yes, this is something that I would like to devote my time to. Um, and i like for you to remember why you decided to do that, um, to think a little bit about what the heck you were hoping to accomplish with, um, with this early childhood recommendations panel and with your role on it specifically. Um, and I'll take a minute for us to just pause and think about that. A quick reminder on our timeline. So um, it feels like a long time ago, but in February 2020, Governor Kelly signed uh, her second executive order of the year um, to designate the Children's Cabinet in Kansas as the State Early Childhood Advisory Council. And just as a quick reminder, this is something where uh, federal law says that this is something that states should have, and uh, Kansas's Early Childhood Advisory Council had existed at one point, and there had been some great work underway to get that up and running. And then for a variety of reasons, it had um, kind of, it, it had, uh, there were not members who were currently appointed to it and it was not regularly meeting. And so in, uh, in February, as a state, we were able to address that and set up, you know, here's our vision for making sure that we are uh, both complying with federal law and that we're able to um, develop the kind of governance structure that we need to put our new state strategic plan for early childhood into action. And in April, the Children's Cabinet appointed the first members to the panel. Um, I remember in, in March figuring out a, and having a, a Zoom where we thought about um, what the work would be. And I remember saying something like, you know, maybe we'll have to meet by Zoom for the first couple of months, but I think that we'll be able to make it work. Like, I, I think that we'll be able to come together. And um, it, it was easy, I think, then to get really excited and think, gosh, um, by the summer, by the fall, life is going to be maybe not back to normal, but is going to look different. And in April, um, we were able to appoint panel members um, to, to get this work kicked off. In July, we had our first meeting. Um, and at that meeting, we, as I said, we adopted some role. Uh, uh, we, we talked through what our role is, um, and we agreed to some shared norms for how we do our work um, and developed some procedures for how we would get work done. In, uh, in between July and October, we had our first work group uh, come together and work on the Kindergarten Transitions Memorandum of Understanding and the accompanying recommendation. And in October, we uh, wordsmithed through that and made our first formal recommendation to the Children's Cabinet, um, which the Children's Cabinet accepted in December. So there's a couple of highlights from our work so far. 
And you all right, might remember that before our first meeting, everybody filled out a survey. We had a really fantastic response rate, which uh, made our, our evaluation colleagues at KU who were helping us develop that survey really excited because they said, gosh, this must be a really engaged bunch. This is a really high response rate for a survey. Um, and, and one of the questions that we, um, that we asked all of you is what one issue do you want to make progress on over the course of the next year? Um, so each of you were able to share, you know, here's what we really want to see. Um, and I hope that you're reflecting on that right now. I went through and um, reviewed those to, to think about that. So I'm going to flip through a couple of those responses. And they're, they're all anonymous, no worries. Um, but I'd like for you to be thinking, what did you hope to achieve when you applied to join? Um, are we making progress? And then I think that um, I'd also like you to be reflecting on what's been your favorite thing that we've done so far? And why is that? So. Here's a couple of those responses from July. We had a, the, the big theme that stood out was this idea of um, strengthening the overall system, building connections, building relationships, and helping us work um, more cohesively, where we have some shared terminology, shared policies where possible, um, you know, some, some common goal setting so that we're working in the same direction and um, coordinating with one another. We, we talked about, you know, just having a better understanding of the landscape. Um, so understanding, you know, here's, here's what's going on. Here's what our early childhood system consists of in the state. Um, and then really the idea of being able to connect with one another so that we can accomplish more together than what we might be able to achieve individually. We also um, talked about some really tangible or that there were responses that spoke to some really tangible things that we wanted to see. So being able to really support communities so that communities have the tools in their toolbox that they need or have the information and framework that they need to be able to solve problems that they see at the local level with solutions that fit in their community. Um, talking about being able to really identify and think about where are the real gaps in our system? Where are the pieces where um, either public policy or other private initiatives are just not, um, not getting the job done in terms of achieving the kinds of um, availability of services or the kinds of outcomes that we would like to see in our state. And really thinking about how, um, how we can adopt strategies to improve access to address those issues. So this is the part where I open it up for discussion because I'm really interested in hearing from all of you um, what your reflections are as you think back over, um, over the last six months. And I will say, um, I do want this to be a very um, frank and open conversation. So if there are places where you feel like we, we can and should be doing better, um, this is a great time for us to be able to raise those so that we can consider how to work more effectively in the future. Um, because I'm certainly not under the impression that uh, that we have already achieved perfection in, in all things in our group uh, or in our Kansas early childhood system. Um, so I'm, interesting, I'm interested panel members, what are your thoughts on these pieces? This is Tanya Bullock at Child Start. Um, so in the first section where you discuss the cohesiveness and uh, that kind of tied to somewhat of the work I had said I wanted to do where we have a lot of um, leaders in various agencies working collectively towards a common goal. And I can tell you, um, hands down, looking at this group, um, I have either had half of this group reach out to me personally, or I've been able to reach out directly to um, get work done at a local or state level and partner up with a lot of these other organizations and um, personally with everyone to start working on getting things done um, across the state. And I don't know that I would have been able to achieve that um, if it wasn't for this group and being a panel member, um, it, it's made it easier because we're all coming together doing this work and, and having these meetings and panel members. I mean, I can see one person who immediately after this meeting, we already have a meeting scheduled um, at 12 o'clock today um, to work on some more things that we're trying to get going in our area. Um, so whether it's in our area or across the state, we're getting things going. And I feel like we're making progress um, 
whether it's as a group or spreading the wealth across um, as smaller groups or bigger groups. Mm-hmm. So um, I- I'm feeling it. Well, and Tanya, I really want to underscore, um, you know, when we think about our norms, we highlight that um, we think that leadership is something that is really an activity, not a, not a position, not a particular spot that you sit. And I think that the real, um, especially when we, um, when we don't have the parking lot conversations or the gathering around some coffee, um, but before we get started at the meeting and we don't have some of that same opportunity to connect during breaks. I think that the um, each of us being able to really own our uh, ability and our leadership to be able to reach out and make those connections um, after meetings and really have that initiative and that follow-up, I think that that's a, a really incredible strategy that all of us can take that relies on each of us doing it well to really make this group work uh, effectively. What other reflections do we have, panel members? This is Emily Barnes. Um, I want to kind of piggyback on what Tanya just said, that the cohesiveness and collaboration. um, You know, I came into this with the lens of a family child care provider, and and oftentimes we kind of feel like things are happening around us and not necessarily with us and sometimes to us. Um, And I had spent some time trying to understand what was going on. And the more, the more I came to understand and learn was to see the level of dedicated active work going on behind the scenes. Um, And so for me, it's one of the, you know, I came in hoping to kind of, kind of be a part of bridging that gap of, you know, where is the, you know, where is the disconnect between this information and that information? And what I have seen is not just dedicated work, but like listening with the intent to move that conversation forward. Um, Like if we're going to talk about favorite panel meeting, I have to say last month was my favorite panel meeting. Um, A, the conversation that happened told me um, this group was listening And then when the topic of um, the topic from September about, you know, whether or not um, professionals in, you know, providing early childhood care, whether it's in a center or home-based that oftentimes they won't take care of themselves enough to take sick days for various reasons. When that topic came back up, the message, my takeaway message was this group cares and this group cares about these big issues and not just cares, but they're going to care with some form of follow-up action that may look different than we initially intend, but there's going to be follow-up action. And so I have to say that that has really helped me see how strong, um, how strong our, our field is and the steps that we are capable of taking. Um, as a result of all of this, you know, one conversation that I had had was about how, um, as a child care provider, I've participated in you know, many of the grant programs, like, you know, through Family Conservancy and things like that. And after being a participant, I would spend time as a mentor um, providing mentorship support to other providers who began the process as a participant in the subsequent years. Um, but I walked out of it, even though having a very good positive experience, I walked out of it with nothing that I could use as professional development. I couldn't use any of the clock hours because I had already taken the trainings. Um, and the, the time that I spent providing the mentorship to my peers didn't count for anything in my licensure process. I wasn't able to provide any proof that, you know, Hey, I may have spent, you know, 10, 12 hours through a grant cycle doing background work to make this or that learning session happen. Um, And in talking with um, some people, attention was able to be brought to that um, with ideally um, the idea that maybe that could be a part of conversations going forward. And so I just have to thank everybody that in the bridging, there's also this active intention to take topics forward. because it, it's benefiting everybody.
Thanks for that, Emily. I want to give a big kudos. I know I did previously to Debbie Deer for doing the research and pulling that together to have the follow up. And I know that um, for me, it has been just night and day to have um, because of the preschool development, the, the federal preschool development grant to be able to have the staff capacity to really have somebody whose role it is to um, attend these meetings and to really be listening for those items of follow up and then keep the work moving and driving forward over the course of the month. Um, really is, uh, I, I think, a, a huge benefit and a huge resource that we have as, as a panel to, when we're thinking about our, um, our work. And my, my takeaway, or one of my takeaways from your comment, Emily, um, is that really uh, continuing to listen with an ear for um, thinking to ourselves, okay, what's the next step? Even if we don't know, even if we don't have a clear picture of the work plan everywhere from the next step to solving the problem and having the policy enacted, being able to keep looking for, all right, how do we keep, um, how do we keep making progress and um, keep moving forward, even if we don't know exactly the full path to get there. This yes, is that there's. <clears throat> Go ahead, Heather. Um, I just have really appreciated um, hearing in this kind of a forum more from local folks and people from across the state. I think that that has been huge. Um, you know, we always seek to get input on things from a diverse group of folks from a variety of locations and um, with a variety of experiences, but Often I think it's easy, uh, especially speaking from someone that works in Topeka and operates a state program, if, you know, to get off, off center of what would truly be beneficial at the local level. Um, and so I think having a lot of local folks involved in conversations here has been really uh, powerful and I, I really appreciate that. And the family voice, that has been really good as well. So I'm excited to see um, all the awesome things that this group can tackle over the next stretch. Thank you, Heather. I think that's such an important point, um, especially when we think about Kansas. I mean, I'm sure that um, I'm sure that every every state wrestles with the um, the, the opportunity to make sure that state processes and local, um, local processes are coordinated. But I think especially in a state that has so much local control, when we're thinking, whether we're thinking about 105 counties or 286 school districts or whatever it is in Kansas, we really like having it be very distributed and very local. And um, the value of being able to hear, gosh, here is what we are seeing on the ground, um, I think helps us all have a good mental model and a good shared understanding of um, both like perspective of what's going on in the state, but also the, the diversity of what's happening in different communities. You know, that sparks an interesting um, follow-up, I wonder question for me from our state agency members of the panel. Um, I know that, uh, that between the state agencies represented, we've had lots of conversations about, gosh, how do we really coordinate? How do we have shared leadership? How do we make sure that we're aware of what's going on? Um, and I know that that's looked differently over the years. As you're reflecting on, um, on how we're doing right now, do you feel like th that we've currently got the tools to be able to understand what's happening at the various state agencies between um, whether it's this meeting or our webinars or other opportunities to come together, or do we need to be thinking about how to continue to build um, build relationships and opportunities to coordinate? Does that question make sense? Amanda, this is Amy Gottschammer, and that, that really does make me think that we could use more, I, I know, and because I, 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 I hate to say it because I think it'll fall into Debbie's plate, <laughs> but um, and, and I attend all of the, you know, the All In For Kansas Kids meetings and everything. So I try to stay as up to date as possible. Um, but it seems like that most of that information um, does come from the upper, uh, you know, the state level um, agencies. And, and I'm wondering if there isn't a way to do maybe a, like a monthly newsletter, just even of our group to just say, 
here's something that I've been working on. You know, we could just sort of highlight, we could make our own submissions. So, you know, Debbie's not working, worrying, we're not worrying about content, but we could just say, here's a, you know, five sentences or whatever saying what I'm working on right now. And that might, that might spark a connection between somebody else um, at, a, at a lower level in their independent agencies um, or businesses and organizations where they might want to make a connection. Just a thought. I really like that thought, Amy, and what it sparks for me is kind of the, um, the I wonder. I'm not sure how many folks on here subscribe to the weekly All In for Kansas Kids email updates um, to get those, but we, uh, Mandy Enfield coordinates the content for those, and I find myself wondering, um, gosh, if we're really trying to, to get the word out, how might we be able to... Um, to maybe think through like, um, and maybe it's a, a, a presentation or some conversation about how we really tie together um, those weekly email updates, the Wednesday webinars, and then the stakeholder meetings that are after the children's cabinet um, to be able to have it all be one cohesive, okay, we're a system trying to work together and here's the tools we have in our disposal. Um, or not in our disposal, that sounds like a garbage disposal. Like here's the, here's the tools we have available to us um, to be able to move some of that forward. And Debbie is going to be uh, taking on more of a role this year in organizing the webinars. So Debbie, I don't know if there's anything that you would like to say about that piece. Well, I think that as I'm learning more, more and more about all of this, and I like so many of the comments that you're making because I really do think that some of the positive experiences that you're having with the panel was exactly the reason why the panel was created. Um, and it's what its purpose is. And hopefully we can decide together what the purpose is moving forward um, and what you need from that. But I like your comment, Amy, minus the fact that, you know, it might create more work for me. <laughs> because, you know, there's, it's come up in so many conversations about, we didn't, we didn't realize you were doing that. You know, when we're coordinating meetings and we're, we're coordinating work, it's like, instead of reinventing the wheel, let's get together and let's, you know, you're already starting this, let's, let's just see what's going on. So I completely understand what you're saying on how, how do we get that information out. Um, as far as your um, question, Amanda, with the webinars, I'm really excited um, about getting more involved in the webinars because I think all of you know that several times we've referenced the webinars and said, you know, if you weren't able to watch this, um, here's the link, please watch this before our next panel meeting because this work ties into what we're going to be talking about. And, you know, just continuing, I mean, the webinars have been so um, amazing so far, but just continuing to kind of have all of those um, platforms in mind as we're doing our work and um, how that can all tie together and help you do your work and just get the word out more because maybe somebody who watches a webinar doesn't attend the early childhood stakeholders group because you know they're not able to. So just reaching out in every way that we can, I think is our goal. And um, I'll say one more piece and then go to Emily Barnes and then to uh, Chelsea Schulte. But one piece that I don't know that we have said uh, loud and clearly and simply in plain language is if any of you as panel members have uh, pieces that you would like to include in those uh, weekly email updates or every other week webinars, if you have a topic of conversation or a piece, a project that you're working on where you would like feedback or would like to get the word out, those are tools that uh, are available for all of us working in the early childhood system. Um, and places where we are more than happy to turn over the mic or to share the, um, the, the opportunity to draft content to make sure that those are available to get the word out because we, we think that it is helpful for us to have some, um, some places where it's easy to go if you're a Kansas early childhood stakeholder to stay up to date on what's going on. Uh, contacting Debbie is a great first step um, to be able to do either of those things. Emily, go ahead. Thank you. Um, what Amy and Debbie's points are making me think of is like with CCPC, a lot of times when we get information, we try to summarize the main 
point into a graphic that then could be posted on social media to the link where people can get that information. And that might be one of the, the steps forward that we as a panel decide to take. And maybe this goes into like the engaging providers um, group that is getting ready to start or you know somehow other in the all in for Kansas kids. Um, I think we can chew on that a little bit, but it almost makes me think of finding what would be the most simple way to summarize the information, consolidate it to where then, you know, like, yes, people may still be getting the emails, but then if we have a social media post that brings them back to something that was in the email, that would trigger the person to remember, I, I got that through email. I need to read this in more depth rather than getting overwhelmed with all their virtual clutter and perhaps tuning out some of that information. Um, and then it's also hopefully would prove to be a concise way to take what we have summarized or what we have discussed as a summary and people can either have a link to the YouTube video or link to the, can the children's cabinet website or a link to whichever organization presented valuable information in the discussion Mm -hmm. That way, then people can be going directly to the source of what we have talked about mm -hmm. in our little summary graphic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. I was uh, writing down ideas. I got a, um, a, a note from Sarah Gardner. Hi, Sarah, out on the YouTube. And she uh, helps coordinate so much of this work. And she said, gosh, um, yeah, having ideas and having content um, to be able to share is really helpful. And Emily, I really like them thinking about how do we make it easy? We talked a little bit about this last month. How do we make it easy for us as early childhood champions to say, hey, if you are a friend of mine on social media and you are interested in, you know, fill in the blank early childhood topic here, you should really check out this, this newsletter because we've got some opportunities for you to get involved um, and just making it easy for us to um, engage in that way. Chelsea, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I guess to kind of back up a little bit, when Amy spoke about, um, you know, say attending the webinars and reading the emails and staying up to date, that's something that I also do. And I would venture to guess most of most of this group is. Um, that is an assumption on my part. Um, and based on Debbie's comments, I think we're maybe already moving in that direction of um, a more cohesive organization amongst all of those tools. Mm -hmm. um, for example, when we had power of the positive, mm -hmm. is that is that the right presentation? And 1-800-CHILDREN, like, I don't know, like a week before or two weeks before they had presented at the um, Wednesday webinar. So for me, it was really hard um, kind of, it was, it was hard to continue to stay engaged during our panel meeting because I felt like I had just heard all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I heard it in the webinar, I was thinking about it from the panel perspective. And that's a, a personal, that's how I process information. So I would be curious if um, if that's something we feel like collectively as a panel, we could say, if this is information that the panel needs, then let's make sure that, you know, if it's presented beforehand, that we watch that beforehand so that we wouldn't have to then have, we can make more use of our time when the panel is together if we've all already seen the information. Mm -hmm. And I hesitate to say that because I know that we're all very busy. And if, if we didn't watch the webinar, it's probably because we didn't have time to watch the webinar. Um, so I think that you could take that with a grain of salt, but that would be my advice that we can maybe use our time more effectively if we can and get some of that information in advance. I'd love for panel members to quickly weigh in on their thoughts on that piece, because Chelsea, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. We wrestled with that, that back and forth with, um, gosh, like if, if I'm a panel member and I didn't catch the webinar, um, how does that feel in the meeting or like what happens to the conversation in the meeting? And is it better to be on the safe side? Like where's the right balance, right? Or maybe it's the, the webinar goes in depth on a topic and we um, are making sure that we share like the elevator pitch version of it with a, here's where you can find more information. But I really like that thought of, um, I mean, especially if we're able to kind of cue things up so that we're able to say like, all right, panel members, you definitely want to make sure that you tune into this webinar or block off an hour or two or half an hour to, to watch the content um, before our next meeting, because that'll be the important background information that you'll need. What do we think, panel members? Does that seem like a reasonable way to do our work? 
Hi, Amanda. It's Christy Smith from DECA. And um, hi. And so I think you're, you started to go down a conversation that I had my notes on, which is really, I felt like my hope for this panel is, was mobilizing efforts. And mm -hmm. so I think it goes beyond information delivery. And it really is, you have all of these champions that are together. And we really have these adaptive challenges that we're faced with. So how do we mobilize that? And to me, the presentation that you just had articulated, which was, here's what it is, is more technical, right? Here's the information, here's what it is. But our role I see as a panel is really then taking that, how does that fit with families? So one of my procedures that I still feel that we have to tackle, and my hope that still lies is kind of that unusual voice for our families. I'm not sure how much of our work has still really penetrated to the family level. And this group as being champions still I think has the potential to say, so we have that, for example, 1-800-CHILDREN, how do we then mobilize that to get to the hands of the families that we are, that we are serving or caring for? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and I think, um, Christy, you know, really thinking about um, we're not just trying to develop and share information, we're trying to create and execute action items. Um, so being able to have really clear takeaways or next steps for each of us as individuals in our work, I mean, being able to say even really clearly, um, being able to really clearly articulate and ask of, okay, we have heard uh, a presentation on a new tool and now our ask for each of you is to uh, take that back to your organization, share it with people and think about how you can uh, use it and adapt it is kind of that next step where, where um, that can even be something that we are co-creating together where we are saying, okay, at the end of a presentation, what might each of us do as individuals to move that forward where we're kind of personally uh, pulling out our to-do list and action planning. Agreed. It's, it, it, you're absolutely right. It goes to, so we've engaged this team. So then how do we engage all the other teams that we're networking with or that we are connecting with? And mm -hmm. how do we then help to um, transplant, just, just keep pushing it into all of our kind of the socio-ecological pieces that we, that we are reached out to. So taking that and integrating it into all of our networks, you're absolutely right, but it's engaging those other voices who do not hear that information and can't. And to sometimes to Chelsea's point who can't attend that meeting. So I feel like it's kind of our responsibility as champions to help disseminate that too. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Adima, what do you think? Hi, um, I would just echo what Christy said. I mean, I feel that one of the reasons that I joined this panel was that action piece. And I think she just nailed it because I feel like um, I was thinking of some of my favorite parts of being part of this group have been these offshoots, like the Kansas beats the virus, like mm -hmm. things that we can actually do. So I say put us to work <laughs> um, because I feel like that's a really, um, it, you know, I, I guess I signed up to really contribute, right? And I feel like, um, you know, I, I do enjoy hearing the presentations from different groups, um, but I, I, yeah, I think that piece that's missing is then, well, what can I do in my role to, to take these things and, and create some action? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other thoughts before, uh, thank you, Chris, for a T minus five minutes to our 1015 break. This is Deanna Berry. I um, agree with everything everyone's been saying. I would just like to add, I think when I uh, was hoping some of what would, would come from this group and it will happen over time is actually going up um, a level of hoping to, and I see some things happening, but I'm not part of being at those tables, but at the state level with all of the, the programming that impacts our little ones across different agencies and programs and levels, um, you know, over the years, um, still learning things that, oh, I didn't know that department or I didn't know. And 
for me, I would hope as a long-term goal, this group could, whether we or you at the table in those meetings, that maybe be able to make some recommendations for, hey, maybe should this department be under this one or should these people be at the table? We've missed them in the past, but they're really crucial from this other department. Um, but I just think when you talk about at the local level experience, when um, there's not necessarily coordination coming down from the different you know, entities we might be interacting with and that you know, by you guys being able to, I think this vehicle seems to be helping help with that mm -hmm. communication, but um, I don't know if I'm articulating this very clearly, but I just think that overall having more cohesive communication at the state level mm -hmm. across, you know, entities that would help all of us on the ground. And I think you're making lots of good steps with just, you know, the language we're using and getting all of the various partners to the table so you so you guys are even informed about oh that's out there too you know from our level so um i see there's some beginnings of that being able to come from this and so um, i would hope that we as as it's appropriate that comes to discussion here maybe where we could support something that is um that you guys are seeing from that day-to-day -day work mm -hmm. Go ahead, Melissa. Deanna, I just want to thank you for raising that issue because I, I uh, as this panel gets its legs under them and, and gets up and running, that's my hope is that you all will originate ideas and proposals and, and not wait to be asked to work on something. I want you to feel empowered to make recommendations for ways that we as state agencies can improve on the, the way in which we administer the programs that, that touch your work. So I, I, I um, you know, the, the example of the kindergarten transitions work is a good one because that was a project that you all workshopped, you know, the, the subcommittee brought the panel things that were then, um, you you had a workshop session and 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 refined and and finalized those documents and then it brought it came forward to the cabinet which you know if we recall the the structure of the executive order the cabinet actually is the advisory council but you all are where the programmatic expertise lies so we at the cabinet need your recommendations in order to take action in our role as the early childhood advisory council however you should feel that that you have the power as a recommendations panel to identify projects where you as providers in 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 your your everyday work are feeling the need to, to improve, you know, this thing is a barrier. And, and if we could just strategize together on how to, to recommend that we're listening, we are, we are listening. So that's what I want to share with you is, is um, go forth and, and recommend because it, it's not, sometimes we will have questions we bring to you and say, we know this is a problem or we're, we have this opportunity to make these, you know, make changes or whatever needs to happen, but we want your input, but it's a, it should be two way communications. And I just wanna add back to the very beginning, in some ways, I think being forced to do this via Zoom, um, some of what you said about those of us who are really far away from Topeka, um, even though we're not able, I think a mix of both once we get, you know, maybe back is good because it sure does make it uh, easier to actually be able to participate in everything and, and be at the table. And so I, I have appreciated that quite a lot, you know, as time has gone on, those of us that travel a lot, you realize, oh my gosh, we spent a lot of time on the road away from work. And so this really is helpful too. So I, that's back to, uh, I agree at the beginning, so. But thank you all for 
uh, getting this off the ground. Thank you, Deanna. I think that's a great piece for us to keep in mind moving forward. Folks, it is 1016, so we're going to take a 10 minute break and then I'll go to you to kick us off to keep or to keep reflecting, Marita. Sound good? Awesome. We will see you all at 1026.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Let me find our slide. There we go. I tried to check my email during the 10 minute break, which is always a, a dangerous, dangerous game. Amanda, this is Lori Kravitz. Can I just make note of something I should have said Absolutely. in the first half? Mm -hmm. um, the link that Mitch referred to with the tax mm -hmm. credit, I, yep. I will. we will make sure that we post that to the KDHE uh, CCL webpage on the provider awesome. page too, and just make that available. I just wanted to make note yeah. that we'll do that. Thank you, Laurie. That's exciting. We're gonna give people just a minute or two to, to return. The update from Lawrence is that the snow is still coming down. It's nice and thick and looks very pretty, which makes me happy. I signed up to judge state debate this afternoon, so I'm excited about that, but I'm looking forward to definitely having like a big sweatshirt and a cozy, cozy blanket and feeling nice and happy inside. Amanda, I'm assuming you're doing that from home. I am indeed. It is all on <laughs> Zoom. Uh, so, or yeah, this tournament's on Zoom. So wish, wish me well. The technology, I've been pleasantly surprised. I've judged a couple high school tournaments this year and um, Almost all of the technology errors have been mine and not the students. Yeah, I, I was thinking one plus of the virtual meetings is we might have canceled today had we been meeting in person. And so mm -hmm. allows us to keep moving when we have snow days, so. That's a great point, Amy. And I mean, at the end of the day, like is it, um, if it means that one fewer member of the panel has like a, a scary experience on a highway, that's. I think totally worth it. I mean, the, the safety and well-being and all those pieces. And, I, and you're right, Amy, I don't know that we would have been as brave pivoting to a virtual meeting the morning of um, a year ago. So we are, right. we are stronger and more adaptable than we know. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we can go ahead and pick back up where we left off. And Maritas, would you like to, to share your reflections? It's good to see you. Hi everybody. Um, I am I am honored to be a part of this panel who are passionate about our early childhood work. I want you to know how much I appreciate what you do. Um, I joined the panel because I want to better understand the early childhood landscape in Kansas and how can I integrate the services of the Kansas Deaf Line Project to serve the early childhood community in our state. This has been a challenge and an ongoing problem for over 10 years, um, not only in Kansas, but in other states as well. And you may not be familiar with it, but that's another topic at another time. I, I cannot do it alone. And I joined this panel because I need you. I need your input, and I hope and to be given the opportunity to share with you in the future about the work that we do, and hopefully um, create a recommendation on how we can solve this challenge that has been here for a long time. And so I am really, I'm grateful to for this panel that there's the place that you can go and talk about whatever is your thinking or your issues about early childhood. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maritas. And you know, that gets me thinking, as we're thinking about any of our work, whether we are in a, um, a government organization or a private organization or as an individual, I hope that we are thinking about um, you know, as we are work planning an initiative or as we are wrestling with an adaptive challenge, thinking about our system and the tools that we um, have in the system and the organizations that we have in the system so that we can say, um, 
and I, I think that's a fantastic example. Okay, we have something like the Kansas Deaf Blind Project where we want to make sure that there is, and if I'm mischaracterizing this, certainly do let me know, but we want to make sure there's awareness of this. We want to make sure that it's integrated into work um, so that we can achieve that end of having families who need the service being aware of it and being um, being able to access those services. And so thinking to ourselves, like, gosh, does that entail a recommendation for how um, state agencies or service providers uh, make information available to families or incorporate information into ongoing resource lists or communications. And I hope that we're thinking about um, that, that each of you individually are thinking about the panel as being one of those vehicles where you can feel very empowered to, um, to reach out and say, hey, could we have time on the agenda? Could we uh, ask for panel members support in workshopping uh, a particular issue or moving something forward? Um, so that we can accomplish really meaningful work. And I want to make clear that um, that's something that each of you as panel members have the um, ability to do. This is not just me and Debbie getting together and deciding what the agenda is going to be moving forward. This is work that we all, um, that we all can do together. Um, and particularly uh, for maybe my, my state agency colleagues, I know that it takes, um, that it is hard to, to work plan in a way where you are thinking, gosh, where are the points where we need to gather feedback and how do we back up the timeline to make sure that we meet our deadlines and also build in the time for really meaningful engagement. I know that that takes additional work um, and that's something that uh, I know that we on our team um, have been thinking about as we consider um, how we might um, how we might structure our work moving forward. So I, I hope that this can be a helpful uh, vehicle in that regard, because sometimes um, sometimes it feels like 80% of the work is uh, finding the time and scheduling the time and getting people together on the Zoom to ask for the feedback. So having this as a forum that's available where that piece is done and where we hopefully have good rec uh, uh, representation across the system, um, know that it is a tool that is uh, certainly here to, to partner. That was a lot of me talking, and I'm sorry for that. Um, what other reflections do we have? Any other favorite bright spots of the year so far? Amanda, this is Debbie. I just want to jump in and just, um, I am just so excited right now to hear the comments that everyone is making. These are so helpful. To us because um, as cabinet staff and some of uh, the staff from our KU team, we've been meeting recently and having really serious conversations about what does panel meetings 2021 look like? And the feedback that we're getting from all of you today is going is so helpful in kind of leading us in the right direction. And um, like Amanda said in the beginning, even if it's not exactly a positive, it's like, how can we improve? You know, those types of comments are important too. And when I joined the panel um, as a provider, um, not, not even realizing that I was gonna be in the role that I am now, um, you know, my, my ask was, was the collaboration piece and, and the cohesiveness, but also as Christy and Deanna, I think, and several of you have mentioned, whatever work we're doing, that it can be used um, by the people that are doing this work every day, boots on the ground, um, and taking that work straight to them and letting them use it. And I'm proud of the, K of the uh, MOU toolkit that the Kindergarten Transitions did, because hopefully that, that is a piece that communities and individuals can use. But um, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the work that you do, the people that are serving on work groups. I know that's additional time. And just thanks for your feedback because I'm, I'm filling a notebook full of notes and this is exciting to think about how we're going to move forward. Thank you, Debbie. Mallory, did I, did I see you come off mute? Yes, thank you. This is Mallory Arlano. Um, I just really appreciated all of the partnerships made and connections. Um, I have emailed from concerns from my community out here in Garden City, some people that I've been connected through um, the panel. So that's been really exciting. Um, and you've had emails from me about things, but even before I joined the panel. So it's just really exciting to actually work with you too. 
and everyone. And personally, I've just learned a lot. Um, my background, um, I worked in childcare and I was a preschool teacher. And then, you know, recently in the last few years, I moved to higher ed. And so I just wanted to gain more knowledge and be an advocate for early childhood um, and partnering everyone together because we know how important it is. And we're trying to break through the ice, I guess, and, and showing everybody how important that is. So it's, it's been exciting being a part of this. So I appreciate having that opportunity and working with each and every one of you guys. Thank you, Mallory. And that, that sparks, I'm, I'm curious if the panel might be um, willing to try something out at a future meeting. I was uh, visiting with a friend last night who shared that she had been in uh, a Zoom meeting where at the beginning of the meeting, instead of, we, we were talking about icebreakers that we do at the beginning of the meeting to help kind of build community, especially as our teams have um, been in different locations for quite some time. And she shared that she was in a meeting where um, they did the random Zoom breakout feature at the beginning to break everybody into small groups of like three people to answer an icebreaker question or kind of get to know one another. And I think she said the whole thing lasted about five minutes. W would the panel be interested in that kind of thing at the beginning, kind of our replacement for the um, get to know or like the, the informal conversations that might happen in an in-person meeting? I see some nods. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, investigate how, uh, we'll confirm that we know how to technically do that. Um, and maybe we'll try that out at a future meeting to, um, I don't know about all of you. I really miss the, um, the connection building aspect of in-person meetings. Um, Cornelia, go ahead. So, um, you know, when I initially, you know, had interest in joining the panel, um, you know, it was excitement of, um, you know, being part of, um, you know, having a, having an ability to be part of the dialogue as we shape the early childhood landscape for for Kansas. Um, oftentimes, um, I'm involved in early childhood committees where we are all like-minded individuals who talk about things, and then we just talk about things. Like we're all in agreement, and we're all like. We all know that this is a problem. We all know this is a strength. And um, yep, it was great dialogue. And then we go back to our everyday work, um, but nothing happens. Uh, you know, it was just a great venting session or a great, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, what I've, what I've really enjoyed about the panel is that, A, we have the freedom to be candid, um, you know, and to talk about, um, you know, the, the good stuff and the stuff that we need to work on. Um, but that it's not just going on um, deaf ears, uh, you know, that we really do say, okay, if this is something we need to address, we have representatives from like all of the state agencies, which in itself is like, wow, uh, you know, I mean, that, that historically has not really been like everybody at the table together, recognizing that early childhood is everybody, um, you know, it impacts everybody. And so, um, you know, it's great to then uh, see the needle move, um, you know, even if it's in baby steps, it's not empty dialogue. It's dialogue where we can talk about things um, and then something happens with it. And that's what's um, really been pretty cool about it. Thank you, Cornelia. And I will say, um, you know, to the, what's been some of my favorite piece about the panel, um, you know, those conversations that we've had where we have taken time to reflect on COVID from a big picture and where we've been able to capture that in the meeting minutes and then have something really tangible to refer back to. Um, I want to give a huge shout out, shout out to my colleagues at some other agencies um, who have uh, stepped up to the plate in a huge way. Um, but I know for me, when I am reflecting on um, some of those big picture decisions for, for where we go next or when I'm participating in conversations with um, folks at my own agency about what priorities need to be in the future. I can't tell you all how helpful it is for me to be able to go back and refer to those minutes and have that really tangible like, all right, we talked about this, we, we gathered feedback, here's some of the big picture thoughts that we have, um, because it can feel a little bit overwhelming when we look at the scope of the challenges that we face um, moving forward. So that's been, um, that's been my personal favorite piece thus far. I am checking the chat. Any, um, so the piece that we're about to shift into is thinking about some of our priorities moving forward. 
Um, I haven't heard anything in here that, um, that makes me think that our procedures are a barrier to our work. Um, or I'm not, I'm not hearing any, any, um, I, I've got some ideas for maybe tweaking the agenda or thinking about how we communicate with one another, but I, I don't know that the formal procedures that we have in place um, thus far, it, it seems to me like we are, that we have been able to get something done. Um, does that, and I'm not sure that we have seen any barriers along the way um, due to the, the procedures that we've set in place for ourselves. Is that a fair, fair summary? Rachel, Anna, go ahead. Yeah, and, and no, I don't think we've created any barriers. I do just kind of have maybe a suggestion or a recommendation mm -hmm. moving forward. And mm -hmm. it fell off um, the K-pop discussion earlier where um, the repeat of the presentation. And is there just maybe a possibility of a way that we could, instead of repeating the presentation, you know, as part of the agenda, have us mm -hmm. review it, um, and then maybe look at it more on an in-depth level with, mm -hmm. um, you know, what are their ask of us? What, what are they needing from us? And what is an action plan we can leave that meeting with mm -hmm. um, so that as we move forward, we are creating action and taking action and not just um, hearing information. Yep. Thank you, Rachel. And I can really easily imagine, um, you know, we've had a, a handful of people reach out requesting to present to the panel and I can, and we've kind of been trying to figure out how we direct and help people understand, all right, here's our, uh, here's how this might be able to work. So Rachel, I really like the idea of saying like, okay, these are the points that we want you to address where it's really clear um, for the people who are coming to present, here's our, our expectations for what you'd be sharing with the panel and what the discussion would be like. Thank you. All right, we will. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm, I'm interested, panel members, what would you recommend that we, um, that we think about prioritizing? Um, I'll, I'll share a little bit of background here. We've uh, had some conversations and uh, Debbie is going to be working on more of a, or is going to be working on an outline where we're able to see, all right, here's kind of what we've got on the horizon and on our to-do list for the panel. Um, and so I, I am very interested in, in all of your thoughts as we consider how we might, um, how we might prioritize things for 2021. I'm, uh, this is this is Chelsea Schulte. Um, I was thinking about this in terms of um, we've all been talking about you know the the action that we want to see things happening, um, mm -hmm. and I I find comfort in the uh, the sub grants that just were awarded that those are on the ground action happening, not necessarily by me, but um, mm -hmm. and that I I'm really curious in in what exactly is happening with all of those, um, and I'm curious if we as a panel would have any um, any part, if there's any expectation for us to be, um, you know, looking at those, if, if there's any recommendation we can make about, mm -hmm. hey, we know that this project's going on and we think that this should be getting scaled up mm -hmm. you know, at, a, at a faster rate, this would be, you know, beneficial across the state. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's overstepping or if that's somewhere where we could support. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chelsea. Amanda, this is Amy Gottschammer. Mm -hmm. um, love what Chelsea just said. I'd love to hear more about what everybody, the grants that everybody wrote. Um, but in thinking about panel membership, um, recently many of the groups and committees that I sit on um, have somebody that, that plays a role in specializing in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I wonder whether or not that means we need to bring somebody else in or if there's somebody already on the panel that would feel comfortable taking a role like that, just to kind of always make sure that we are working from that lens um, in our language and in our actions and discussions. Mm -hmm. And Amy, as you think about some of those um, some of those uh, examples of committees that you've been on, is it, some, do, are, you, are you speaking to, you know, there's somebody who's formally designated for that to be um, part of their role or? 
Um, can you speak a little bit about what that looks like? Right. It, well, yeah, I'm not sure if I, I, I don't have job descriptions per se. They usually are just another member of the committee. Um, some of them are brought in specifically, and these are different groups that have of have agencies and maybe have somebody that's employed in that position. So I don't know what it looks like in an all volunteer situation, um, but they usually will just be, um, you know, offered an opportunity to, to, you know, to, to review things that we may write, um, actions that we might look at taking, um, and are just generally, you know, made sure that they have an opportunity during all discussions to say, hey, you might want to think about this. You might want to reword your language here. You may want to elevate your um, your belief in equity and inclusion and diversity higher up in your priorities, um, things along that line. So I think it could easily be somebody that just feels like they've got a lot of experience in this. Um, it wouldn't necessarily mean we have to go out and find somebody, but but maybe it does. It's just a thought for the group to mull over. I I would add to that if that's something that I, I would agree that I think that's a good idea, but I do think it's something we should outline in our um, information. If possible, I know that, you know, the, the expectations about who is involved is kind of outlined already for us. Um, but in speaking of that, yeah, there might be somebody here already that says, yeah, I'd be happy to take that role. Um, but when they, when they leave, I don't want that, that idea to go away, um, that we still need to keep that, um, piece involved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, um, completely agree. And I would love for Jenny Flinders to share a little bit about, um, about her role and the, um, both the, the work that she is doing as part of the overall all in for Kansas kids work. And then maybe also how, uh, we might be able to translate that or continue to, uh, to do that uh, here on the panel. Yep, good morning. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so I am uh, Jenny Flinders. I work at the Center for Public Partnerships and Research at KU. I um, have that oh I'm like, I can think of all the things to say about this. Um, I've been working with a number of uh, underserved and uh, sort of historically systemically oppressed communities in the state for several years now and had the opportunity to join the panel um, and also the sort of overall all in for Kansas kids work uh, from a sort of an equity and um, diversity consulting perspective. Um, I am so glad to hear everyone bring this up and have ideas on how this might be more operationalized because I think that, you know, um, as the panel has has gotten itself kind of up and going, I personally have just been doing a lot of um, behind the scenes, sort of watching and 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 looking for those uh, opportunities to review the language and really reflect on how it's operating. And so it's not, you know, it's not enough to just sort of plop in representation. It has to be really uh, purposeful and meaningful and and and, um, and inclusive and the overall operations of the panel itself and the work that we do have to be a good fit to and be and be done in the right way that it um, sort of fosters that inclusion. Um, so it's not just a performative sort of thing that happens. Um, so I've been observing and thinking about all of those things from the back uh, background a little bit while also doing a lot of um, personal uh, reach outs and uh, relationship building to bring in more uh, voices and representation to the group. So I, you know, whatever that might look like for us uh, moving forward, I'm definitely open to being a part of that um, and, and doing what I can to help um, do that in the future. I will say I also um, lead the Our Tomorrow's work that we are doing at our center. And I think that there's a really big opportunity there for what the panel overall can recommend and get involved with in terms of looking at the unheard voices represented in that that story bank and and um, also recommending ways that we can expand and diversify uh, that the the voices that are in that increasingly growing um, and and rich bank of voices from the state. So that might be something we could look at soon, Amanda. Um, think, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else specifically you want me to say about that, but I am so glad to hear it coming to the forefront. I got the opportunity to um, 
work with the the cabinet on the equity statement that was released and I you know maybe that's something too that the panel would want to do um I think someone mentioned including some language about that so I love the word um, operationalize there, Jenny, and thinking, because I think that um, that what we're, uh, what I think about in this is um, how we, uh, I think we've got some, um, some framing type pieces in our, um, in the procedures that we've outlined. So when we think about um, that template that we developed for recommendations that's outlined in our rule norms and procedures. There's kind of a question that's built in around um, how considerations of equity informed this recommendation. And I think that um, when I think about our process, I imagine, okay, how do we make that really uh, meaningful where we're able to um, where, the, where this isn't like a, a worksheet that we're filling out for a recommendation, but where we're having good solid conversation around each of the pieces and where it's built into our process so that it's kind of institutionalized um, in that way. So Amy, I don't know if that answers or if that, or not answers. Um, I don't know if that, um, I, I think that I, I really appreciate you highlighting that this is something that we need to continue to be thinking about and um, that each of us both has kind of a personal responsibility as we are on the panel to um, be, be really um, asking ourselves, how are we embodying our norms in the way that we are um, using our, our role? And then also as we're thinking about our big picture work um, to be considering how, um, how we are uh, addressing issues of equity as we move forward. Emily Barnes, I, oh, sorry, Christy. Emily Barnes, is your, uh, is your comment about this topic? Uh, Christy Smith, you go ahead. Okay, so um, Kansas Strong, which is a work group, and it's really, I think that um, mm -hmm. Debbie had highlighted it last time, but it's more specific to child welfare and safety and permanence. However, in that work group recently, um, Becky Aiken through KU, so Jenny, you may know Becky, um, had helped us um, create a covenant and guiding principles around an equity statement. And we actually adopted it through um, Governor's Council on Fitness. So I took that same mm -hmm. statement and we reached out to Becky and said, hey, um, we did such, I mean, really, it was, it was really great work, no reason to reinvent the wheel. So then we took it to the Governor's Council on Fitness, who is now going to adopt that. So I can share this with you, Amanda, so that you can kind of, I don't think it's a way that we have to reinvent, but I can give you like the three big buckets and then there's things underneath it that are specific, concrete, Evidence. So the first one is we believe in the equitable treatment and worth of every person. The next mm -hmm. one is we believe that change is possible um, and each individual's contribution to the process is vital. And the mm -hmm. last one is we believe in transforming our organizations and institutions to be more than just equitable. Mm -hmm. And then below that has like the commitments. And so the commitment piece may be what this group needs to flush out a little bit, but it would, um, give at least a foundation to get that work started that Amy had recommended. So you can sit Christy, would you be able to send that to Debbie Deer and then Debbie can yeah. share that with all the panel members when she is um, sharing the, the follow-up from this meeting? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Can I really quickly add uh, just uh, Chelsea and Amy uh, to go back to highlighting the subgrants? We had a, a meeting and they did address uh, and ask us if it was okay to um, publicly highlight and post what everybody did submit uh, their work for. So it should be coming out at some point what, what we had all written for. I just don't know when or how they're going to put it out there, but I know they did ask us if it was okay. And personally, I said, yes, go for it. I want everyone to know and hopefully um, help or join in on the effort. So it should be out there sometime soon. Emily Barnes. Hello, thank you. Um, I want to, um, I, I would like us as a group to start putting some effort towards looking at some of the professional development opportunities for um, early childhood professionals, um, whether they're center-based or um, family child care providers. Um, 
I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic has highlighted nationally the need for high quality professionals and um, that has been met with um, an increase in new trainings. I've seen lots of new training opportunities and I think that's amazing. But I would also like to see as a group that we prioritize um, looking at the concept of a framework that allows for when you have providers and other early childhood professionals who have a, a significant level of experience and expertise in the field and they're struggling to find new trainings that we create a framework that allows for mentorship to increase their professional development that they could actually start working towards whether you know it's other credentialing professional credentials or things like that but we open up the conversation um, that allows for things like the mentorship opportunities in the state that have gone on through um, the different grant programs in recent years, that some of that effort actually count toward their licensure or toward, um, like I said, professional credentialing or college credit, things like that. Um, and I, th I think it's important to open up that conversation um, so that we have our field not just receiving training for the purposes of fulfilling their license, but that they are continuing to sharpen and hone their skills and that what we are offering the children and families is a higher level of expertise every single time they fulfill their license and that we end up with stronger professionals every single year. Eva? Oops, sorry. <laughs> had to find the unmute button. You know, bouncing off of what you just said, Emily, I mean, um, I'm a faculty member at KU and personal preparation is like really near and dear to my heart. Um, and um, so, you know, totally in terms of the ongoing professional development, but also I would love for us to really in Kansas um, take hold of this notion of we've got to recruit new people um, we have to think about how do we make, um, you know, how do we get folks coming in as early childhood um, educators, um, whether that's early childhood special ed, whether that's licensed person, you know, I mean, we need to make um, this, this field, um, the young people who believe they can change the world need to come into this field, <laughs> bottom line is. And all schools of education across the country, but um, definitely in Kansas, we are experiencing um, downward trends in folks that are coming into the field of education. And we need to think about how can we um, really entice folks and then and entice going back to the whole issue of, um, equity, um, how can we support um, a very diverse workforce while also recruiting? Um, anyway, I'll get off my soapbox, but I think that would be um, a really wonderful thing for us to be doing. Lori? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Emily, I love that you're uh, bringing conversations um, up that probably um, need to have at least that we can uh, begin to even talk about uh, what, what does mentorship mean and um, just start putting some questions to those first initial thoughts. Um, and I would love to be a part of any ongoing conversations. Of course, um, under KDHE regulations, there is a requirement for uh, professional development and there is some requirement for KDHE approved by the secretary. So um, I would love to be, of course, a part of those initial conversations. Um, and, but I think we do need to step back and, and those conversations need to start with those beginning questions. Emily, you specifically brought up mentorship and I think mentorship is so important um, across um, the state. Uh, we, we have some mentorship going on in links to quality, that peer-to-peer -peer learning um, is so essential, but, but we do need to determine as a state, what, what's the line between uh, mentorship and then professional development? Um, because I think there probably really is some distinction there. <clears throat> and who's a qualified mentor? If you're going to start attaching some kind of hours to it, I think there's just a lot of discussions. I don't think it should just be pushed away and uh, uh, because I think there's some true benefit that can come um, out of this discussion and who knows where it will lead. Um, so, so thank you, Emily, for bringing it forward. And, and um, 
Uh, and this is probably the right place to start that conversation. Um, it, it will be interesting, but, but I already like have a lot of questions rolling in my mind just, just from this little bit here. Um, just anyway, that's just my initial thoughts. Well, and can I, Lori, can I jump on to your thoughts? Cause I, I love what you're saying because um, for me, it's important to know that whatever we do, we have a solid framework that um, we have expectations, that this is not just somebody says, well, I've been doing it for so many years and so you need to listen to me, um, but that we, we have a way of showing that there's, um, there's quality knowledge behind what is being disseminated in whether it's mentorship or professional development or you know, whatever it is. And, and the, like you said, we have to have conversation and we have to discuss it. And for me, where the thought process came in was actually listening to Amy in Power to the Profession back last February and realizing the conversation has already begun. So let's, let's keep it going and let's figure out how do we make this work? Um, if other industries have ways of providing some form of recognition or professional credentialing or you know, however it works for you know, mentored type situations. Uh, specifically speaking, I, um, for many years, I, I worked in applied behavior analysis and actually, I actually sat for the exam for um, the assistant behavior analyst. I, I passed my assistant behavior analyst exam. Um, unfortunately, I was never able to actually use my BCABA because I began um, childcare and didn't have a way to actually do the, the supervision. Um, and so I know for a fact that other industries have formats by which it can be supported. And so opening up that conversation of how do we translate that into our field and have something tangible that um, in the end provides the highest quality for the children and families that we serve. Rachel? Yeah, um, and, and I agree with Lori. It is, we, it is something we are looking at um, very strongly in links to quality and we kind of do it um, you know, because of the peer support groups, you know, they're doing it informally already because they meet and they, they discuss and they mentor each other. Um, but it is something we're looking at moving forward. So I think Links to Quality would like to be in those discussions also moving forward just to, to make sure that what we're coming up with um, is consistent across the state and can be um, implemented as, as soundly as possible. This so, is Amy Gauchi. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that I, I recently for our Lawrence chapter KSA OIC meeting, I, I, I did, um, we had a whole discussion topic that I facilitated on leadership in early childhood. And, and the discussion was about the fact that there is a huge gap that we really don't, don't support leadership in early childhood. You know, there's the, you know, there of course are directors in each program, but there's the, the wide, wide majority of people that are involved in early childhood are not in a leadership role. And because it's a little bit counter to the kinds of people we are, you know, leaders are usually um, considered people that are more, you know, decisive and, um, and not as nurturing, uh, you know, as most early childhood providers are. And so these kinds of discussions about mentoring and taking on leadership roles that um, may or may not be directly tied to your official job title at work, um, I, I think are really exciting because it just builds that, that, that belief that, that we all have leadership um, qualities in us and, and that we have knowledge that we should, should and want to share. So I would, I would definitely applaud any efforts towards the mentoring and the support of, of leadership um, in early childhood. Go ahead, Paula. Yeah, so I love this conversation on professional development, and I would feel like I was neglecting my duties if I didn't say we also need to address compensation. Mm -hmm. And so just a couple of thoughts is really digging in and doing a deep dive on some models that might be out there where states or localities are really addressing compensation, because if we really want to get a diverse, equitable workforce, we need to compensate people. And um, so I think that's an important piece. And that makes me also think about, I know we're working on our state plan mm -hmm. and I would really like to see us think about how we do our market rate survey. Mm -hmm. And are there different ways? Because looking at how people charge 
in basic in their community doesn't really reflect the true cost. And so we are really uh, doing a disservice to the provider community um, by not really thinking about how we look at our market rate survey in a new and different way. Can I speak about that a little bit? Absolutely. So uh, the market rate survey, um, it does take the information about what people are charging, but it also looks at what it costs for high quality childcare. So we already, that already is being looked at and built into the system, but of course there's always more work we can do. Well, and um, to build on that, you know, when I think about um, what my hopes and dreams for uh, this group are, it definitely is, gosh, being able to say something like, okay, we need to be able to scan and research, Paula, exactly like you said. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in this area. Maybe there's like five different ways to do a market rate survey, right? And be able to lift them all out. Um, and say, okay, what might the pros and cons of each be? And I think that we've really got the folks here with the technical expertise and the, um, the, the eagerness to, um, to be able to do that kind, of, that kind of work. I do want to hop back to the mentoring conversation, if that's okay. Um, I'm wondering if a good next step might be for Emily and Amy and uh, Rachel and Lori and Debbie to perhaps have a conversation about how, what the panel might do or like what, when some agenda items might be, just like do some planning for, okay, here's what we would like the panel to do. Um, does that seem like a good next step? Yeah, I mean, this is Lori. Um, I think probably a, a first step would be for us to meet. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Just yes to your question. Um, yeah, because I think we're, we're, it's so early in this conversation mm -hmm. since it just started here um, oh, yeah. that we don't even really know what we may need to bring back or if we need to bring back mm -hmm. to the panel or if the panel or, or if we need to take it somewhere else. Right. So, yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, uh, I think the next step is that conversation. So. Perfect. Um, I will highlight for this bunch that there is an entity in Kansas called Mentor Kansas, which is housed at the Kansas State Department of Education. Uh, Paula Smith, I will make sure that you all have her contact information. My understanding is that it primar primarily works on mentorship opportunities between adults and youth, um, but probably there are connecting with Paula to understand their work better might be, um, might be wise too. Or I I'm sure that they, I've, uh, Gosh, when we were back in the office when it was warm outside, I remember having a conversation with Paula while we walked out to the parking lot together where we chatted about mentorship. So I know they've got a lot of exciting work underway. Any other, as we're thinking about priorities for the year ahead, I can share one. Well, we had um, a, a really helpful conversation with, um, I'm going to credit Sarah Gardner with this idea, but we were looking at um, our governance chart in Kansas. And she was like, you know, what are the pieces when we're thinking about any individual issue, which group is uniquely positioned to be able to address it? Um, and like which, which items when we're thinking about the groups, what, how can we think about the area of best fit and how we can make the most impact and really make the most of, um, of the membership who's there? I really appreciate and thank members of the panel for the work on um, kindergarten transitions. I think that's something that's going to continue to be important. And I do think that this group is uniquely positioned to think about that given the rep representation from both um, pre-K-12 schools and community-based organizations and state agencies, um, and certainly the important role that Head Start plays in all of that. Um, and then the other piece that I was thinking about is one piece that uh, Natalie McLean and I have been visiting about a bit, which is thinking about our Kansas early learning standards. Um, those are something that is not owned by when or owned, but those are something where it really is shared work um, among agencies and among entities in the state. Uh, and I do think that it, it's worthwhile for the panel in 2021. Um, I would like for the panel to take a look at those standards and not, not um, do the full work of revising them, but make some recommendations about whether um, they are due for an update. And if so, to develop a work plan um, for what that would look like. 
Does that make sense? This is Amy Meek, and I, I, that was some, I was just going to mention, I think that's some work that um, could be done in 2021, and it's time, and, and also considering maybe um, looking at the dissemination plan mm -hmm. or other uh, way, because um, it just seems like maybe that was done at the beginning, and then now it's kind of fizzled out as far as um, getting those out and making people aware of them, and um just bringing some more attention to them again, especially if we do update them. So. And Amy, I apologize. I absolutely should have credited you with that because uh, you, we were visiting about these before the holidays and you were the one who said, gosh, the panel really does seem like a great group to be able to work on that. So thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Panel members, one piece that I want to uh, spend about five to seven minutes thinking about is uh, thinking specifically about panel membership. So uh, we've been doing some initial work on, on this piece um, to develop a timeline for what this will look like. We uh, want the children's cabinet to be able to approve the slate of members who will start um, in July, 2021. Um, we want them to be able to approve that at their June meeting. Um, and we are envisioning a process where there is um, both reapplication for current members and then the opportunity for uh, people who are not currently members to apply. Um, and some of the pieces that we are thinking about are here on the slide um, where we have discussed as a panel, you know, there's great opportunity and value in having continuity because it means that we have people who know one another and we're able to really maximize on the work that we've done this year to create some shared understanding of topics or to um, build on shared relationships, while also recognizing that there's value in continuing to, um, to create opportunity for uh, new voices to be part of a conversation so that um, a group isn't, um, isn't stagnant or isn't, um, it, it continues to have opportunity for fresh perspective. Um, we've discussed uh, as a panel, the importance of ensuring our representation reflects um, both the makeup of our overall system and also the demographic makeup of our state um, or the geographic makeup of our state. Um, overall group size, I'll say that uh, I was initially, uh, I don't know how well of a job I did of hiding it. In July, I was really scared about being able, uh, our, our ability to uh, have conversation with uh, more than 30 participants on a Zoom. I found a new feature on Zoom that enables me to see everybody at once, which I might need to show to all of you because it does, um, I have actually been really pleasantly surprised that, um, that this group size has been manageable. And then we're also, um, something that I've visited about with Debbie is just making sure that we have good, strong connections to those other councils and committees and work groups that are underway so that um, we have the ability to know um, what those groups are working on and what we're working on so that there's not duplication of effort. So I don't know, panel members, if, um, if you all have thoughts around the general, um, the general membership of the panel or pieces that, um, that you think that we should be uh, keeping in mind as we are developing the, the process for setting that membership for 2021. I will make clear that ultimately it'll be the children's cabinet that appoints um, that membership. And that's Christy. I would um, just say that if we're really trying to um, drive business um, support that it might be worth to invite Chamber of Commerce or somebody along those lines to be um, an active panel member. And um, of course, a family um, member would be a good addition to but bringing in just consider bringing in some unusual voices to the to this to the panel. Mm -hmm. Well, and I will say that we very much appreciate both uh, Cassandra and Sarah for, for their uh, representation on the panel and their continued connection to uh, the KDHE Family Advisory Council as well. And um, Christy, I love the idea of thinking about business. That actually has me thinking about um, perhaps the Department of Commerce or some of uh, the work happening there too. This is Emily Barnes. Um, as we get the engaging providers group going, um, ideally the result would be that we get providers um, interested in joining on. Um, one of the things that I think needs to be 
uh, we always need to be cognizant of is that it may mean that we have to actively keep like a subgroup that could meet outside of typical business hours that, mm -hmm. you know, if this group needs to meet during business hours, mm -hmm. then we actively and intentionally find a way to have connection always with those educators and professionals who cannot access this during this time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. All right, and the last question that we have, um, and you all may have been looking at the times on the agenda and been feeling concerned, but do we, um, do we feel that there is a need to discuss any changes to our role, norms, and procedures document? All right, that sound that you hear is me breathing a sigh of relief because uh, it would have been really challenging to do that in 15 minutes um, as we were uh, working through the last pieces of our meeting. I wanna say, gosh, thank you. Um, this discussion was really, really uh, helpful and productive and is something that I really appreciate um, each of, of you exercising your, your active leadership to uh, speak up and share perspectives and help move our work forward so that we can all uh, work effectively together. So we are moving at warp speed through uh, the discussion of this. Um, as a reminder, um, anytime that you are looking at those documents or thinking about uh, the way that we do our work and you see a need for a change, you can feel welcome to share that with me and Debbie. Um, and we can share that with the full panel for conversation, uh, just as we did for the uh, plain language changes today. But that brings us to uh, the end of our agenda, a request for future agenda items. And as we were visiting, um, we actually, it, it sparked that, um, that we have a, a request for a future agenda item, which is a, a brief update, or not a brief update, which is um, the next steps on the Kansas vaccine plan. So Melissa, I'm not sure if you're able to uh, share really quickly how, um, how that work is going. Um, yes, Amanda, thank you. So the, um, the, the vaccine distribution plan is a state um, Kansas Department of Health and Environment document that is, it, it, it's been developed in, in close um, alignment with obviously with CDC guidelines and some national um, work groups and national frameworks for equitable distribution of vaccine. Um, Kansas is currently in phase one, which is the, the frontline healthcare workers and um, seniors and, and staff at, at um, nursing home facilities. We will be transitioning to phase two in the, the coming weeks, um, and you will hear announcements officially through KDHE. What I wanted to bring attention to with this group today is there is a fantastic website Amanda's put in the chat kansasvaccine.gov. I, I um, am very impressed with how well it's laid out and how clear the information is. It's easy to navigate. Child care is pretty prominently featured in um, the hierarchy of, of the phases that we'll be moving through um, child care professionals. So that website is where you need to look for information about the shift in phases and when it becomes available to you. Um, and I, Amanda and I will keep a close eye on the, the progress being made and if appropriate at the February meeting, we might bring a pr um, presentation. Um, as she mentioned, um, I think the workshop aspect will be your help in understanding how best to communicate with the, the universe of families and uh, colleagues that you work with in your, in your roles so that we can help bring effective communications um, to bear to make sure people have accurate scientific information about the vaccine, about why it's important to get it, and about, and then obviously the key is um, information about how to access it. So we've got communications work. It will tie into the work of the Kansas Leadership, Kansas Beats the Virus work group. Um, so stay tuned, but Please, in the meantime, watch this website for information. 
And then Amanda, if I can shift and just share that while we've been meeting this morning, there was an announcement from the Federal Small Business Association that they have reopened the um, Paycheck Protection Program with some changes. So I know when we visited um, this past summer about that, that relief program, um, you had to have a relationship with a bank and many of our providers are with other um, types of lenders, particularly um, uh, credit unions and, and groups like that. So I, I think what's key is this time that type of lender is part of the program. So I would encourage you all um, to make sure that you know what's available. I don't have more information to share right now because it's just occurred, but um, that's another really important link in terms of relief for small business owners, which childcare providers absolutely are. So um, probably our, our Department of Commerce website in Kansas would be a good link to information. Thank you, Melissa. We will make sure, um, Debbie, to share the Kansas Department of Commerce website when we share our follow-up information. And I'll remind panel members that um, something that they've done previously that I would imagine they will continue to do in the future is that on that Kansas Department of Commerce website, there was kind of a live chat feature where you were able to type in questions and get uh, personalized assistance to be able to do things like figure out, um, okay, how do I access the Paycheck Protection Program? Other requests for future agenda items. All right, well, panel members, um, I'll say the beginning of our meeting went really quick and I wasn't sure whether you'd be getting significantly more time back in your day than uh, seven minutes, but you were getting seven minutes back in your day. So congratulations. Um, here are the upcoming meetings. These are uh, all going to be via Zoom, you can see the kindergarten or the, the various work groups. As a reminder, the, uh, the work groups meeting information will be posted on the Early Childhood Recommendations panel page of the Children's Cabinet website. Um, and then we will meet next on February 19th. I will highlight for everybody that the, the Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund meets on February 5th. And in the afternoon, the Kansas Early Childhood Stakeholders Group meets. Um, that group will have the opportunity to workshop some of the stories in the story bank that Jenny referenced earlier. And so we will make sure to share the information um, that was sent out about uh, what that information is and how you can uh, both share your own story and gather other stories and how you can get signed up for the February 5th Early Childhood Stakeholders Group meeting when we send our follow-up email. Otherwise, we will look forward to seeing you on February 19th. I hope you all stay safe, stay safe and warm this weekend, and we'll see you later.